His name was Richard Etheridge. You probably don't know him unless you have spent time on the shores of the Outer Banks in North Carolina. You see, the waters off the coast of the Outer Banks in North Carolina are called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. They are called that because the currents are so severe that that 200-mile strip of land that runs from Virginia Beach down along the edge of the U.S. has had 5,000 shipwrecks in the last 500 years, and that's the only ones that have been counted. Richard Etheridge grew up enslaved by a family on those outer banks where he was taught to dig clams, swim in the currents, fix things, row boats out to wrecks with other enslaved people to pick up things that were floating away that might be valuable to the family that held him. To their credit, they broke the law and taught Richard Etheridge to read. And when the Union Army pushed the Confederate Army off the Outer Banks, Etheridge was old enough to join them, and he served in the Civil War. And then he signed up to be a Buffalo soldier, came to Texas to patrol the road between San Antonio and El Paso until he moved back to the Outer Banks, an educated man who served in the military. He moved back to serve in the United States life-saving service. Crews of men in what the government called checkerboard crews, and he guesses on why that was the, the name, because they were black and white men who would patrol the beaches and attempt rescue missions of the wrecks on the Outer Banks. Every day, these men would swim out in currents and storms, and they learned to shoot a cannon that would drop a rope onto sinking ships, and they would navigate rowboats in waves that would surely kill you and me. The thing is that the black crews, the black crew members who were skilled and adept at the rescues, mostly because they were from that area, they knew those waters were never allowed to rise in the ranks of the life-saving service. They would return from dangerous rescue missions, swimming and pulling and boating out in dangerous surf, and return to the station where they were then put to cooking and cleaning and washing while the white crew congratulated each other in repose. One day in 1879, a ship wrecked near Pea Island Life-Saving Station, the same station where this white captain oversaw his checkerboard crew, and refused, he refused to send men out into the surf. So when survivors from that wreck actually reached the shore, they found the men in the Pea Island Station asleep. The white commander and crew were fired. In their place, the African-American veteran Richard Etheridge was appointed the new station keeper. And because in 1880 it was illegal for a black man to have rank over a white man in the employ of the American government, Etheridge hired all a black crew composed of men who he had served with in the Civil War. They trained and rescued ships and saved lives and had dangerous losses of men. Ships went down, people were saved. There were moments of celebration. There were moments of mourning. And one day on October 11th, 1896, a three-masted schooner, the E.S. Newman ran hard aground near the Pea Island Station at 7 p.m. in the middle of a hurricane in which the winds were exceeding 100 miles per hour, the torrents so bad that the whole island was covered in water. No land could be seen. And the ocean was so violent that they decided they would not launch the surf boats but shoot the cannon rope out to the ship. 
at which point the cannon sunk in the sand. So Etheridge asked for two volunteers. The two surfmen stepped up. The plan was to tie the men to each other and that they would carry a rope back and forth to pull in survivors. The two men were tied together in case one or both drowned because it was the code of the surfmen to, that everyone had a proper burial in their core. One by one, the surfmen rescued the captain and his family and his crew from the SS Newman. An impossible rescue that took until 1 a.m. when they were all in safety on the shore. Now, if you and I were there on that night in 1896, we probably would have agreed that these men should have been rewarded or awarded the life-saving service medals of the U.S. government for extraordinary and extreme bravery. The men who rescued the E.S. Newman received no medals, no recognition, and no thanks. They went about their jobs, and Richard Etheridge died in his bed as station captain in 1900. His crew would last another 47 years on Pea Island. And no medals, no honors, no thanks were given to Etheridge or any of the men who risked their lives for over 50 years to save ships and commerce and sailors and passengers who crashed onto the Outer Banks. Invisible and taken for granted, the men who saved all those lives in terrible conditions and sacrificed their own careers were washed away like the sand in the tide of history. That is until a 14-year-old girl named Katie Burkhart lived in North Carolina, chose a social studies project in the year 1995, 100 years later. She was appalled to discover that the Pea Island crew never received any awards because they were black. This 14-year-old white girl living in a town held once by the legacy of slavery decided she was going to do something about it. So she wrote to her senator and then President Clinton and with the help of Rear Admiral Stephen Rokon on October 11th, 1996, descendants of the 1896 crew were awarded the U.S. Coast Guard life-saving gold medals in a fitting and formal ceremony. This story might never get told if black history is restricted in our country, in places like Florida, in places like North Carolina, in places like Texas. This story might never be heard if the systemic forces of historical erasure have their way in our schools and society. And I know this isn't even one of those stories that scares the governor of Florida or Texas. This isn't a story of a massacre or a lynching. But this story could be a metaphor for America. It is a story that is a metaphor for America built on the backs of slaves and their ancestors who hardly have sat in the glow of honor for anything they have done. It is a story that reflects an America which has in its advantages of those of us who are white given over to ignoring difference, loyalty, commitment, and risk of those who are not white. It is a story of how intrinsic we have created invisibility of black people in our society. It is a story of a people who literally waded out into the water like their ancestors did, who waded out to protect themselves from the dogs that chased them down through the swamps to prevent the dogs from finding them, 
It is a story about claiming agency, of doing what is right beyond the differences of skin color and heritage. It is a story of liberation also. Because despite the sacrifices and doing the impossible, those who worked with Etheridge were also free. They were symbols of strength to one another and are symbols of strength to us. They were liberators of hope to each other in the impossible situations they were put into. And even though it took a hundred years to receive an honor for who they were and what they did, they are symbols of overcoming an attitude we call white supremacy, which is not about members of hate groups alone. It is about any and all of us who can consciously or unconsciously lift up narratives that whiteness is somehow better than anything else. Do I have to say that again or did you get it the first time? You got that. Today, in honoring the men of P Island and all who have been erased and ignored, in this systemic illness that has plagued us, we counter the narrative of white supremacy. We are part of something today that is not the condemnation of each other and every person here, because somehow we didn't live up to the challenges we are steeped in, but a celebration of building up our commitment to dignity and worth while committing to true inclusion, which faces down racism. Because today in worship, we are part of what we called a weighed effort, a worth and dignity engagement, the kind that we have throughout the year that lifts up ways to guide us toward learning and deepening dialogue and meeting each other. We ask the questions in our weighed efforts. How do we get into right relationship with one another? How do we learn to love without having to teach one way of thinking or being? How do we challenge our desire for conformity but also learn ways to be and speak a welcome of love? How do we center our lives in our theology of love? This church is and has been dedicated to racial equity for most of its existence. It is the first church probably in the whole state of Texas that was integrated in 1949. It is the church that held SNCC meetings when no church would sponsor them. It is the church that has tried to stand up for the desegregation of schools from Brown versus Board of Education all the way to the 70s when desegregation actually happened. And we are a church that's not just about creating safe spaces. We are a church of creating brave spaces where we can grow and love and encourage each other to see our common humanity. And we do this not resting on the weapon of identity politics or things that separate us. We are here to find shared narratives with varied understandings that undergird moments in history and theology, and especially on, in our theology of love. We are here to remind ourselves that we are not to think alike, to love alike, as we say. Our goal is to take account of the traumas which are not easily answered or solved, but to stay present to differences and feelings to learn about inequity and racial difference and division, things that keep us from our highest spiritual values. So we ask you in this church, what will save us? What will liberate us? What will hold us together? What will honor our differences? What will show us injustices? What will help us love through a bond of joy and keep us in our traumas and histories. Today we are holding forth, having been led to this sermon by the song Wade 
in the water. We are intentionally overlapping the worth and dignity acronym WADE with a song that has purpose in its demand on us. Wade in the water, children, comes from the ancient cry, the song that comes to us through the slave songs of liberation via the biblical text of Exodus where Moses leads the Israelites to safety and liberation from the slavery in Egypt. It calls us to wade out into the water, to step in or step forward, to take a step toward healing and freedom and making racial equity possible in the world. One of the stories I love about Exodus comes from the feminist rabbinical interpretation of Exodus is that Moses and the Israelites stood at the edge of the Red Sea with the Egyptian army bearing down on them, wondering what to do when the oldest, most bent over arthritic women in the group pushed forward and stepped into the sea and that is why the seas parted. <laughs> Courageous action is why the seas part, not contemplation. Courageous action leads the Israelites to freedom behind the wisest, oldest woman in the bunch. And if we're really honest, we know that the women are most courageous in among us. The people like Harriet Tugman who Tubman, who sang Wade in the Water so many times, risking everything to liberate her people, knew that kind of courage. That Howard Thurman, who said, for the slaves, the troubled waters meant the ups and downs, the vicissitudes of life. Within the context of the troubled waters of life, there are healing waters, he said, because God is in the midst of the turmoil. God is in the midst of the courage and the struggle of the things we're going through. The poet we read today, a black woman, Tracy Smith, who was a poet laureate, reminds us that even in the past, the pain of it, the turmoil, there is God and there is love. I love you, she repeats in her poem. I love you, she says. Even in the troubled waters, even in the forests, the swamps, the painful past, remember I love you, she reminds us like a theologian. Our work, friends, to heal the world of racism that we experience, that we understand, that we even don't understand, is to heal ourselves and our communities and must take courage. It takes honoring where honors have been forgotten. It takes liberating ourselves and each other. It takes facing the realities of our past and present without shrinking back and not only wading out but diving into dangerous waters because lives are at stake and our society is at stake. And it acknowledges that God, the God of your understanding, must be in all this turmoil. Because the God of your understanding should call you to your highest conception of what is true. In the painful truths of human life and the experiences you have in the world. And it should call you to understand that it takes loving one another to find that God in the turmoil. To wade into the water means that the waters call us to exposure to the real and meaningful, painful elements of racism in our world and also centers us in a loving embrace that is filled with courage. The kind that Richard Etheridge and the black surfman had in 1890 and the kind that the 14-year-old girl in North Carolina had in 1995 and the kind that the Israelites had on the edges of the Red Sea and the kind that those escaping from slavery had and the kind that we have in declaring to one another that we will not let history be wiped clean or used against us. 
that we will build a world that is based on love and truth, compassion and justice. Can I get an amen? You guys are really quiet today. <laughs> and that we will do it together to help us wade out into the loving waters of racial equity. We formed a racial equity task force in 2018. Together, we as a church created a pledge to honor our commitments, to ask members to wade out and dive in with us in confronting the realities of racism and its effects. Some of you ask me sometimes after sermons like this, what am I supposed to do? And I'm here to tell you, here is what you're supposed to do in the turmoil of God that is all of what I'm talking about. We bring to you like the actors yelling in the poem, saying, I love you, I love you, an opportunity to make dignity and worth come front and center in your minds, in your commitments. Today we renew our pledge with courage. That pledge is just the first step into the waters. I want you to hear that pledge in a minute. We invite you to ponder taking this pledge to signing it here in our fellowship hall and more important, importantly to taking a copy and putting it on your mirror in the morning and reflecting on how it changes you and what your commitments are. That living by it in all the ways you can interrupts the forces of history honors the past in a way that speaks truth and love into the world. And so I want to invite Carrie Stewart, who's a member of the Racial Equity Task Force, to come forward and read us the pledge now. This is the first Unitarian Church of Dallas Racial Equity Pledge that was presented by the Racial Equity Task Force in 2018. So this is not the first time you've heard this. I affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I support justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. I affirm that white privilege is unfair and harmful to those who have it as well as to those who do not. I affirm that white privilege and the culture of white supremacy in which our nation and our church were founded and developed must be dismantled. And I support racial equity, justice, and liberation for every person. Therefore, from this day forward, I will, if I am white, strive daily to understand white privilege and white supremacy and how their existence benefits me. I commit to help transform our church culture to one that is actively engaged in seeking racial justice and equity for everyone. I will make a greater effort to treat all people with the same respect I expect to receive. I commit to developing the courage to live my beliefs and values regarding racial justice and equity. I will strive daily to eliminate racial prejudice from my thoughts and actions so that I can better promote the racial justice efforts of our church. And I will renew and honor this pledge daily, knowing that our church, our community, our nation, and our world will be better places because of my efforts. Thank you. Now you could say that pledge and signing it just a little step. And that's true. But little steps lead to bigger steps. And this isn't the only thing we're doing. But we're asking you to ponder how you can embrace a pledge that changes who you are in the world as a way of helping change the world. Because little steps make bigger steps. Friends, if you go to the traffic circle in the town of Manteo, North Carolina, you will see a statue of Richard Etheridge with a posture and gaze of strength and courage and calm as he stands with his feet firmly planted, holding 
the large, long oar of the rescue boat in his right hand. The statue was unveiled on May 8th, 2010, the anniversary of Etheridge's death. And it was unveiled by the children of that community and the descendants of the Pea Island life-saving crew. Friends, little actions become larger actions to change. I love you, friends. I love you. I love you. I love you.